Welcome to the Gnostic Warrior Podcast, broadcasting from GnosticWarrior.com in San Diego, California, to around the world. I'm your host, Mo, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Gnostic Warrior, Brendan. How you doing? Doing well, Mo. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. And it's it's great to have you on the show. You're actually the first artist that I've ever invited on. Yeah, it's I've been doing this for 10 years. It's you're probably the only person that inspired me to reach out. I actually bought a, a piece of your your artwork. You know, I bought so of course Yeah, you're welcome. And your artwork really spoke to me. I want to talk about that, of course, but let's get to know you, you know, as a person kind of growing up. Tell us about your maybe your childhood, what inspired you to become an artist. And I know you're also a musician as well, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, well, uh, growing up, I don't know, I've, I've thought about this, and I've, I've been asked this question before, and I think the earliest memories were of my, my grandfather went to school to be an architect when around uh, in like the mid-20s. And when he graduated, the Great Depression started, and they didn't need any architects. He went into, I think, insurance or something but we had a lot of his drawings and paintings uh, in my house and i think the earliest inspiration that that got me into art was probably looking at his work and i was always fascinated by uh, monsters and sci-fi movies and kid kids books and stuff and and i i would always just draw when i was a little kid and that's what how, how i would pass time you know if i was in a restaurant my mom would just bring a sketchbook and some colored pencils and I would just draw away. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think that was probably my earliest uh, influence and what inspired me to get into it. And that's what I would do through middle school and high school. I was sort of just kind of a, a loner in a way. And I would just draw at my desk uh, instead of going out. I did sports and, and stuff like that, but they weren't my main focus. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So, you know, I, I find this is a, a common theme with my guest as far as their love, their passion, you know, the work that they do often, the path that they choose seems to run uh, along the family line, the bloodline sometimes, you know, whether it's a father or a grandfather or someone in the family. Have you looked back further than your father to to see maybe other inspirations and so forth? I guess my family doesn't, we don't know all that much about our lineage past, you know, like names and and, uh, where people maybe came from, but uh, their occupations, I'm sort of in the dark about. You know, and and uh, my brother actually, oddly enough, is also an artist. So we both went to school for illustration. So, but my my dad uh, is still a salesman, and my mom was a teacher. And she she also, you know, I would always bug her when I was when I was very little to to copy things for me and watch her watch her draw. So she, I think, she got some from some skill from her father, who who was the architect artist. So yeah, but that's that's pretty much, and I, I, all my friends over the years, I, I always seem to sort of navigate towards like like minded creative people. So e- either they, they were in, into drawing or playing music or into movies or you know that kind of thing. Yeah, and what uh, what inspired you? You know, your artwork is maybe a little on the esoteric, darker side. Uh, did you start off? You said as a child, you started kind of right drawing like that as well. Um, the, mon- the monsters and stuff. Yeah, um, monsters. But I was also really into into cars and stuff. And I used to get those how to draw books that would take you step by step in drawing like classic cars and stuff. And then I got in more like later into middle school. I got into darker comic books such as like Spawn and stuff like that. And then I also got into more anime, which tended to be a lot darker in its subject matter. And that really sort of spoke to me. Same thing, I got into like punk rock and, and some metal and all the imagery for that was very dark. And I think that all sort of kind of inspired that. But then oddly enough, when I got into college, the school I went to really pushed for a sort of a more professional side of things. And my my style started to kind of lean more, more into kids' books. And so that was sort of what I graduated uh, with a focus sort of in. And then... I went. I moved back uh, home to Syracuse, and I was in a band. And I basically just to get work. I got I got. I fell back into darker subject matter, and that's definitely where I feel more at home. So it's interesting. Have you had any experiences? Meaning, with this darker subject matter, maybe you're educated. You graduated from Syracuse. No, no I, actually, I went to school um, in Philadelphia. At okay. The, 
to the of the arts. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever experimented with psychedelics or anything like that? I haven't actually. <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of your artwork is it's pretty pretty deep and esoteric. You know, myself, I have. I know a lot of my friends that have as well. And then there's people that I've read, and it seems like you know the art that you're creating sometimes. And and again, it's not every piece, but I've looked at a lot of your work. It it seems to have a a lens into this spiritual realm that we sometimes see and that I've experienced since I was a young lad. Uh, I used to be into punk rock too, but I was one maybe of those hardcore guys that went the down the bad path. I, I didn't consider myself a bad person, but I did um, venture into drugs and LSD and mushrooms and, and things like that, you know, and had some experiences. And even when I was older uh, with psilocybin mushrooms, and again, it's not something that I, I do all the time or, or recommend that someone do. But there are these type of beings and these things that you'll see that remind me of your artwork. So it's just kind of interesting. I know you have a lot of people that commission you for your artwork. Do they basically give you an outline of what they want you to draw or are you given free domain? It depends, I guess, on on the client and, and what it's for. I, some some clients are, are really... I don't want to say strict, but they they definitely have a vision of of what they're looking for, and hopefully, I think now now in my career, now that I'm, you know, fourteen years into it, I've developed enough of a style and enough, enough of visibility where people hire me for what I do. But a lot of times, especially when I was younger, people would just hire you because you're the only artist that they knew, and they would try to, you know, make you imitate a style that you didn't like or weren't weren't really good at, and that that is the that is the worst. But a lot of times, most clients will give me like a um, an album title or, uh, and I work with a lot of metal bands, so I'll get like an al- an album title or a, or maybe some lyrics, and then I'll I'll kind of uh, sketch out some ideas based off of what I kind of the vibe that I get from 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 that, um, and then I'll give them options, you know, maybe pick like two or three different sort of ideas with maybe different compositions for each one. And then they can kind of pick which direction they like the best. And then I'll go from there. And then in my personal work, usually it's based off of just sort of a combination of things that I'm inspired by, whether it be something that I read or maybe a, some music I've been listening to or a conversation I had with a friend, you know, and, and, um, but I'm, I'm very fascinated with, uh, world religions and mythology and stuff. So a lot of it comes from stories or characters from that, you know. It's interesting that, you know, you're collaborating with all these, you know, great creative people and, you know, sometimes maybe dark, and then they're all giving you some ideas and, of course, your own visions to create these masterpieces. And then, of course, you're having your own inspirations to to create them. What inspires you? Do Do you have to have some type of like motivation to start artwork or what really gets you moving? That's kind of a hard, hard thing to kind of, uh, I think it's uh, lately I've been really busy with, with some client work. Um, and then when I'm maybe doing a sketch or doing some research, so say if, if I have an idea and it includes a certain character or, or, or a vision of something that comes to mind and and I'll research it for reference shots or just to get maybe some cool details, um, that I, I, couldn't think of up on my own that are tied to that subject matter. I'll stumble upon some other things that I'll kind of jot down as like cool ideas. Or if I'm maybe reading some lyrics or if I'm re- reading a, a, a story and I find a, a line that kind of sticks out to me that kind of creates a visual, you know, like um, I've been reading some HG Wells kind of, kind of catching up on some classic stories that I haven't had a chance to read. And um, certain authors just sort of, I'm sure you. I'm sure you have this as well. Certain, certain authors, the way they put words together, just create. They just kind of grab you in a certain way, and and that's sure. You know, so I guess it depends. And also because I'm a musician as well, and I, I'll divide my time between writing music and also doing the illustration stuff. And and um, I find that I, it's very hard to do both at the same time. I'm sometimes I mean I have to, but um, I find that I have to be. I'm sort of a completionist in a way where I have to finish a project before I start a new one um, because it's very distracting but they 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 tend to feed each other in a way like inspire each other to happen so 
they're both creative projects and you have to put a lot of energy. You know, as I mentioned, I was uh, into punk rock. I also was in bands growing up, managed bands, had my own record label. So I, I know the kind of energy you have to put in to that type of thing. You know, I've never been an artist, but uh, running my own business now um, and doing another business, I realized just it's it's just so difficult. And then also I have my my podcast and my love is the Gnostic Warrior. So it's uh, right. something has to give. It kind of drives drives you mad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's only so much time. Only so sure. much time. Are are you supporting yourself uh, just with your art or? No, no. I um, I'm a I'm a bartender uh, for most of the time. Um, I mean, I, I definitely put in a. I would say every week I pull I put in forty hours doing my artwork, but I I don't make that and I can't support myself with the money that I get from it. So I. Has a bartend on this side, um, but uh, that that in itself actually is is kind of helpful too because you meet a lot of different people, um, and you know it's it's funny because I you met you mentioned the the psychedelics and and um, it's I think people are weird enough sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. um, no, no drugs needed, <laughs> so I, I get a lot of inspiration from from that. Um, people are are car- can be cartoon characters, you know. Um, so it, Definitely. there's never, never ending, uh, material there. Um, but also too, you meet a lot of interesting people with a lot of interesting stories and, um, I, I get it. I get a chance to kind of, uh, maybe explore things that I, I wouldn't think to on my own, you know? Um, and I know enough, I know a little about a lot of things so I can kind of keep a conversation going, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so yeah. I know we have, of course, the the coronavirus crisis going on. Everybody's talking about it, and what's going on there in your neck of the woods, and so, of course, with your your employment. All non essential businesses are closed. So my restaurant where I work, they're still doing delivery and pickup, but um, there's no need for front of house workers. So I, I'm out of a job, at least for the time being, until we can reopen. Um, and hopefully, this doesn't last for too long because I don't know if many restaurants could stay could, could reopen if this were more than a few months you know um but yeah we'll, we'll have see you, yeah have you been uh, following things i mean the, the latest news you know today's march 31st when we're recording this 2020 and they're literally locking down certain states now where you there's you can't even go outside yeah i, I overheard that uh, maybe virginia i think the governor put a like a 70 day quarantine and i know that's not the federal guideline right now but uh yeah I, so far so far new york state uh, hasn't done that um I, i'm in syracuse so it's it's upstate new york it's kind of in the middle of the state and um syracuse we don't we don't have a lot of confirmed cases right now but i think as the virus spreads we'll probably see our peak in the next few weeks but i don't know that's 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 what I think what Cuomo said the other night. Like gotcha. What the prediction is, yeah. And have you, you know, I, I just again, uh, I don't talk to a lot of people. I'm kind of doing my own thing, barely, you know, surviving as it is with everything going on. Have you applied for unemployment? What's that like? If you have, uh, I have. Um, I know was- these are personal questions, but this is like I think you're you're one of millions and millions of people, right? Yes. So. Uh, it's uh, it's. I had a hard time actually logging onto the site um, for two weeks. I I couldn't log in. It would just shut down on me. Or, you know, if I tried to go go the phone route, it would either give me a busy signal or it would. Um, I started doing the the voice prompts and then it would just stop in the middle. <laughs> so I couldn't I couldn't actually uh, do file a claim for two weeks. And I finally was able to. Um, so and I I have a lot of savings. So it's, I'm not. Not too worried, and and if I'm very fortunate, and I don't know why this happened. Maybe uh, a lot of my my clients are uh, just generous or feeling pity, but um, I actually have a lot of art right now, more more art than I've had in months. So I'm just staying busy, which is good. Oh, that's good. That's good news. Yeah, I yeah, think, we're. I think certain 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 uh, a lot a lot of the bands that I know, a lot of friends that play in bands, their tours were canceled and. Their home, um, trying to do online lessons and and trying to 
figure out ways to circumvent all this stuff. But I think certain people, if they have the means, are trying to sort of move ahead as they sort of pr- anticipating that this will be over and they'll need to have something to show after it's all said and done, you know? So I, I'm, I've lucked out in that way where some, some of my clients are in that position. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, if you're going to use this downtime for some productivity, you, you could do a lot of this, you know, whether it be, you know, cover artwork or, you know, getting for the next tour, you know, this would be the time to do it. Let's talk about your music. Are you, what band are you in right now? So I have a, um, it started out as a solo project, but now it's become more of a passion project for me and the vocalist. It's called Diagonal Path. And uh, we released an EP this past April, and I'm currently writing for the, the next album right now. Because it's because we're doing it out of our own pockets, it takes a lot longer. Um, so it, it usually takes about two or two and a half years to kind of get the whole thing done, um, from, from writing to recording to, you know, the final uh, whether we're doing CDs or probably just going to digital this time around because no one really wants to buy CDs anymore. Um, and it costs so much to press vinyl that I don't even want to bother with that. So, yeah, I mean, those are the, the things we kind of grew up with, you know, that we, we love, but put the time and the effort in and it's just, it's just a waste of time and effort and money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so that's one band. And then I have another uh, rock band called uh, same gods. And that uh, we're going to be releasing uh, an album probably in the next two months or so. It, the album's done. We just got to kind of f- figure out our, our plan, you know. And, and now now everyone's home, so this may, might be a good time to start releasing material. So, <laughs> um, But it, it's, it's funny. I, I do go back and forth in my mind about the physical, uh, like, like CDs and, and vinyl and such, because things sort of come around. They come, they come back into favor um and, and back in the trend and i think a certain I, th- I think especially in, in metal artwork is very important and the ritual of listening to vinyl is is becoming more popular again um because you know you have the big artwork you have the lyrics you, and it sort of you have to take the the, the vinyl the, the the record out and it's a very you're, you're very one with the process you know what i mean you have to stay around so you can flip it that whole thing so and I think people do appreciate that certain uh, demographics, certain fans do. So um, it's not dead just yet, but I think you do need to have a following to to make your money back. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Not, and not the, I mean, not the best for a, a, a band just starting out or whatever. No, and when you were talking about that, it made me, you know, kind of reminisce about my youth and as I grew up and, and loving the vinyl, like it said, and looking the artwork and they had a lyric sheet in there. And it was just it was awesome to to do that. And it was an experience. And I think if, you know, more kids experienced it, they would probably purchase them and enjoy it. Just think they haven't really had that experience. So they don't even know it's just alien to them, you know. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, I think I think a lot of consumption of media is the way that it was just 10 years ago is alien to the kids sort of to this next generation coming in. I've had a lot of conversations with even young college kids because I, I work at a, a bar. It's right near the SU campus. And, um, you know, if, if they find out that you're a musician or an artist and just seeing the disconnect of, of how you make money, how you make the actual art itself. Um, because it's so, I think it's so disposable right now because, you know, you pay your $9 and you have access to every single record ever made or every movie, you know what I mean? And, and if you can't, if, as a musician, if you can't win over a listener in five seconds, they just out of the next, you know? Um, and I feel like that there's a big disconnect on the, the creative side of, of art. And I, and I hope that it kind of, especially after maybe this pandemic, people start to appreciate, um, areas of work or you know that sort of were overlooked before people's appreciation for um more bespoke uh american made goods or goods that are made in their around their homes but also just i think again as far as where i'm concerned making artwork and making music hopefully people might start to appreciate the process more and we might be willing to pay a little a little more premium for for that you know but who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows where the world's gonna where it's gonna lead us. That's just so what, my hope. 
<laughs> yeah. Have you had any inspiration with this coronavirus uh, for your artwork at all? Um, I've been well, actually, well, I'm currently working on sort of a a death character right now, so maybe. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it this is this project that I'm working on now is is an album cover, and it was sort of uh, no lyrics, sort of dictated um, the visuals. But uh, I definitely used my back catalog of of uh of imagery and and knowledge to kind of fill in the gap so yeah maybe There's, it's very possible but i i get i can get very cynical um not just now but in general about humanity so <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of the imagery is pretty consistent <laughs> from project to project so the spiritual realm that people don't see I think it it can if you look at Brendan's artwork. Uh, if you Google it uh, when you're done with this podcast, I know a lot of you probably don't know who he is, um, but you will, and uh, you could see that there's definitely a kind of uh, esoteric 3D realm that we're seeing here. And the ancients and the the magi of history have always talked about it. And you know they talked about uh, there was Gurdjieff talking about how we're food for the moon. And if you look at people um, today, and especially if they're not watching what they're doing and what they're consuming, uh, whether it be certain types of media or it's ter- certain types of food, uh, they become food for these um, parasites that live in this, th- this 3D realm. And, you know, some people believe in this and, and some people don't. But, you know, the word spirit comes from a, a Latin word called spira, and it's to breathe. And, you know, our ancestors in religion, uh, when they talked about spirits, they were flying in the air and they would breathe and they would infect us, you know. And um, I believe in in my personal experience, and I'm actually my business is mold. I have a mold business. And um, that was after my son got sick from mold. And, you know, I found out that it was literally eating his body and it was trying to take him. Yeah. And he would uh, just so you know, Brendan, he would have uh, terrible nightmares um, and describe this imagery um, similar to kind of what you draw on your artwork and other people do and talk about hell and these different things were trying to grab him and bring him down and he would be awake and I would, you know, he would sleepwalk. It was, it was a weird time. This was about a two year battle and I felt I was, you know, battling for his life. Um, but as I got into this realm and I researched this history, you know, it goes far back and, you know, they believe these spirits and, you know, like this coronavirus makes me think of um, the spiritual realm and what goes on with what we can't see. And, you know, what I found with my mold business, I, I test for mold and, you know, I'll do air test and it's always around us 24 right. seven. And what, yeah. And what I learned, they, they love to feed on us and our skin. And, uh, you know, and I was thinking they're, they, they mold us. And I, I have these uh, paranormal experiences when I go into certain people's houses um, that I feel aren't right, you know, mentally, physically, you know, those weird people you're kind of talking about, maybe some of the, <laughs> the, the yeah. real dark people that come into your place. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, plenty. <laughs> yeah. So what I've learned, sometimes these people are taken over, I believe by, by mold and, and it's a combination of, you know, they're drinking mold, right? That's what you serve. Um, when you're, you know, a, a, a bartender, you're essentially serving more mar- moldy barley, right? A <laughs> beer, or, you know, mold. So it's essentially mold and it's aspergillus. It's the same mold that I'm finding in these houses. Mm. Yeah. So what's interesting, though, and, and uh, I believe that these molds mold us and they do certain things and they seek to take over our mind and our central nervous system. So, you know, and that's kind of a lot of the things that I would see in your your artwork. And I've had these esoteric kind of um, weird experiences, as I had said, um, and I believe kind of that's the realm that you're painting, <laughs> even though you're so. Yeah, yeah, that's that's well, first of all, how, how's your son doing now? Is he? Is he... Yeah, he's doing. Yeah, he's doing a lot better, thankfully. Um, one of the, the great things when uh, you have something like that is is oxygen. So he had 76 hyperbaric oxygen treatments and essentially it, diffused into his body and you know it um it basically killed a, a lot of the mold and of course he had a lot of different things but he's doing great thanks of course yeah that's great to hear um y- yeah sorry i interrupted you i 
Yeah, no problem. No, I was just, um, I know I kind of go off on a tangent. I'm just, you know, I was wondering, you know, what do you see when you, you start drawing this? I know you have different inspirations, but it seems like you're, you know, you're, you're seeing into this realm. Well, um, so the way that I see sort of, um, the way any, anyone possibly, well, I guess I'll just stick with, with creative people and I don't want to speak for all creative people, but I feel like, um, our, our own voice or who we are and our choices, you know, kind of come from like, if you imagine, imagine your body just as like an empty vessel and your, your decisions are in a way sort of, uh, directed by all your experience. So if you think of every experience in your life as like a, a layer of, of sediment, you know, of like a permeable layer. And, and so life sort of comes through you and it, and it gets filtered throughout all these layers of experience. And then what comes out on the other end is like, is your voice, you know, and, and I, you know, this, I, I've been fascinated by the idea of, 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 do we have choice, you know, free, you know, actual free choice. Um, um, and even if you do have a, a few choices in a certain situation, every choice that you make is defined by your experience, your past experiences, whether it be, whether it be like partially genetic, partially environmental, um, you know, even down to conversations you've had or uh, friendships, relation, you know, romantic relationships, movies you watch, whatever. Um, and that kind of defines like what you do and, and how you interact with society or uh, in life in general. And so that's kind of how I see my art is I've done, you know, I've got so many artists that I love and, and, um, I look at all the time. I have a huge art book collection and, um, and then also when I do research for, for certain projects, you know, I'm fascinated by, uh, sort of different iconography and, and different mythology and, and, but there are so many parallels with every culture and throughout history, you know, and I feel like, all the big questions, you know, human beings evolved to, to be very adept at pattern recognition and, and also asking big questions about, you know, where we come from and um, try, to, try, to, try to answer those questions. And, and we're obviously still obsessed with, with those questions because we don't have the complete answers. So whenever I make a piece, all that kind of comes together. And I feel like even if I'm doing a death character or if I'm doing a bird or, a you know, whatever it might be or a demon – it's sort of inspired inspired by all of these things, you know. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it does. It's interesting, and you know, I found that as well. You know, I agree with you. All that, you know, incorporates into who we are and and what we do. And and with you, it's your artwork, and probably with your music as well. Um, do you write? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, I I write sometimes, um, but. It takes me a long time because I don't, I don't do it very often. I don't have much practice in it. So even writing emails can is more laborious for me. Um, I find it much easier to, to talk to people or, but sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll write poetry or whatever, you know? Sure. Yeah. I was, do you write music at all or? Oh no. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I, I'll pretty much, um, the diagonal path stuff is all of my music. And then the, and bands that I, I was in, in in the past, I was in a band called Freya for like over probably about a decade. And, uh, I was the main songwriter. I wrote probably about 90% of, of that material. So yeah, but yeah, so but same process. I think, you know, I feel like if you do it, if you do it long enough and I'm super obsessive when it comes to anything that I do, you know, and so I think if you're that obsessive and you put that much, that many hours in, into anything, you're going to develop your own voice. It's just part of it, you know? Um, so I, I definitely, I, you can definitely hear probably if you, if you know, um, metal or if you're, if you're well-versed in music, you could probably pick out, you know, the, the influences if you heard it, but, um, it is definitely, I think my version of all those things put together. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, a lot of us do that, that are creative, you know, I did that with my music. I do that now. I try to do that with my writing as you you take from your your inspirations the goal is not to to copy them but they inspire you and it it becomes part of who you are you know it's as if we we kind of mold them but we we become our own creations as well you know and yeah. i think you know we if we stick to that you know and we 
we don't copy people and we, we try to remain true to our own past and our own inspirations, truly unique artwork and divine creations uh, come out of it. And, and that's what I believe, you know, people like you, Brendan, are creating and, you know, I'm sure a lot of the musicians that you're working with. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't personally, I don't think that at this point that we can really make anything brand new. I think it's always going to come from someplace. And it, but I think what you can bring is 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 your own experience and like all the all those hundreds of different little influences that will kind of make it your own. So, you know, what if you're a painter, like the your palette, your how you choose to your mark making, you know, um, your composition choices, uh, texture choices, all that kind of stuff. It, there's so many diff different factors that it'll it'll maybe the, the the basic structure or the basic idea might not be original, but how you actually create it is where the originality comes in, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with you. It, it we never seem to come up with our own ideas. They seem to to come from somewhere else, and it's as if we're we're carrying this baton, you know, and I, it's this weird thing though. I, I, I think you have the same problem as I, I know I get these ideas, but I got to be unique as well. Not like to the, where I'm, I'm trying too hard, but where I got to kind of be, be me. And I, I don't have to try now doing that, but you know, there's other people out there, you know, and especially the younger generation. And sometimes I see it, you know, with my son, you know, he's getting into music and they'll, you know, he'll create that quick, you know, music like a, a, a song in an hour, you know, yeah. be like, what, what are you doing, son? I, I mean, how and then he'll put it on YouTube and they get all these views and it's just like it's they're copying it and they're doing samples and this and that. And I'm like, son, <laughs> you know, I, I would I, I'm from the old school. I'm like, dude, you're going to get an instrument. You're you know, you're going to learn how to play or else you're not you're not going to you're not going to do that. <laughs> you know, well, you know I, I think I think there's definitely um how how people create uh there's i don't think there's one right or wrong way but i and i i definitely think that maybe as an exercise trying to force something out in that amount of time can be kind of cool as a as a problem solving skill and i think that's a good place to start and hopefully maybe your, your son or anyone that's doing trying to make music or make art or whatever um that it, it it inspires them to kind of dive to dive deeper into what they're doing Sure. And that I think inevitably will bring them to that level where they're going to be spending more time on it and and putting more uh, of themselves into it. Um, and I, you know, and there's and I think now because creation, uh, the creative process might be easier than it ever has been in in human history as far as like making music and making art and having all these programs and um, which is I think awesome on one hand because it it allows people to be to explore that in themselves, which I think is extremely important. Um, but at the same time is there is a lot of crap to wade through as a consumer or whatever. There is so much music out there, so much art being made. And it, in, a, in a way it almost devalues um, art, I think, to a certain extent. Yeah, it does the true artists. And I, I think what you're saying is basically don't, uh, kill my son's inspiration to to do music, which I did, and of course he <laughs> he still he still has his YouTube channel, and you know I just want him to like dig deeper, you know, and I, I let him of course um, do that, and you know, and that's what I, I agree with you that the more kind of crap that's created, the more it makes it tough to find you know the Brendan Flynns and the people that are really putting a lot of time in the work, but. Also, the people that do venture into this, you know, like my son, hopefully it inspires them to become a true musician or a true artist um, like my daughter. So, you know, she's like you. Um, all she does is draw from morning to night. She doesn't like to go to school, you know, so she's on <laughs> spring break right now. And she literally just draws and draws and draws and draws. And, and that's what she loves to do. And when I, I tell her, you know, you're going to be the greatest artist and this and that, she just lights up. You know, that's who she is. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it is. And I, I want to um, encourage that. You know, um, she has a website called art artisan your soul dot com. She hasn't developed it yet, but um, that's kind of her thing now. It Again, the website's not even. Um, not yet. Yeah, well, it's we haven't really worked on it. I'm going to put her stuff on there. I've been too busy trying to make a living, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, keep give me a loop. I'd love to check it out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
yeah, she's uh, she's 11 years. She's going to be 11 years old, and um, I'm definitely I'm proud of her. What um, what can you say to those artists out there that maybe are just starting? You know, like my daughter, or have develop their artwork further um what do you what are some tips for them maybe to get some gigs um or to develop their artwork further well well th that's that's a lot <laughs> but i'll start with <laughs> i'll start with the the first part which you know i i've thought about when, when i was in in college well first of all when i was in high school you know i had a my my school had a great um art program but no one you know, the, the, the rest of the faculty sort of when it came down to applying for colleges or whatever, you know, it, it, it was um, it, they didn't know where to put you. You know, if you didn't want to be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, do these usual kind of fields, they didn't know where to put you. So it was like there's a lot of work that I had to do on my own or, you know, with my with my mother or whatever or my brother, you know, and um it was, but it was still like go to school. It wasn't, you know, had I known about maybe doing like atelier, like a, a private study with an artist, that was way cheaper than a four-year degree. You know, I mean, you could you could do, you could probably do twenty ateliers, like twenty, you know, uh, private studies with artists for probably the same amount of money or less than than doing a four-year degree that just like halfway prepares you for the real world. Um, so. I would I would say maybe like be now now with YouTube being so popular and I think uh, every person has a website now um, that like it's I think it's easier to find new options. So I think if if it, being an artist is something that you want to do, use all those tools like you know explore that. Um, but I think as far as like I, the the questions that I wanted answered when I was in college were or or, or maybe maybe not. The answers but maybe just like th things i wish were more were told to me were don't worry about style because that'll come because style i think is this sort of amorphous thing that just is with you your whole life and is going to change with you so i think when, when i was graduating there was so much pressure kids were like destroying themselves over, over having consistent work and having a portfolio that that could get them work and and i know that's important but it was just soul crushing for, for certain kids that didn't, didn't know what they wanted to do. They didn't know themselves, you know? And I feel like maybe if there wasn't as much pressure on the style aspect, um, cause, it, cause you're, it, if you keep making work, it's just going to happen. It's just a natural thing. Um, I think that was the most important thing that I wish was told to, to young artists, you know, it was just keep creating. Don't be afraid to fail. I think failure is one thing that the creative process allows you to do so quickly but it, it teaches you how to like deal with failure um, more, more than any, anything else because you're by yourself. You're not like, you, if you're, I think like you're not with a team, you know, like you can't, if you lose in a, in a game, that's very important, but you have people to cry on their shoulder and you can commiserate together. But with, as an artist, like if you're making something, you can't make it work. You got to figure it out like in, in real time and, and fail over and over again. And I feel like that's so, so important for, for a young mind and for any, anyone really to kind of work through, so I think that's also part of it. Don't be afraid to fail and, and yeah. And don't worry about style. Just make as much work as you possibly can and finish things. I think a lot of young artists also are, are afraid to finish something. And I feel like if you're spinning your wheels, move on to the next thing, you know, don't, you could, you could, you could work on the same piece your whole life if you wanted to, but like why, why build a pristine house on a shitty basement on a, on a ter terrible foundation, you know, just start over again. When does an easy. artist know to kind of scrap the art and, and not, is, is that the flow that you guys all know? I don't know. I, that's a good question. I think that's a personal thing, but I think there is a point where you just, you're, I think there's a little self-awareness there that you have to realize like, man, I've worked on this part of the painting over and over again. I've repainted that hand. Just, just move on to the next. Don't trash it, like keep it. Um, unless it's terrible and if you want to trash it, that might be actually cathartic, but, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think just not, not being afraid to, to finish something. And I think that's also very important if you want to become a professional artist, um, even, even, a, even a, a fine artist. I mean, if you're working with galleries, I mean that you need to, you need to finish art to have art to sell. So I think 
just building that confidence. And, and um, I think also trying to curate a group of other creatives that you can bounce your work back and forth with is also very important. And I think that's one thing that I miss about school. Um, and also Syracuse isn't the, I don't know, we, we have a lot of creative people, but not a lot of support for it right now. Um, not like a bigger city. So you kind of have to create uh, that kind of group online, which I don't think would be a po- problem for a young, for a younger generation, you know? Um, so those are, those are my, my main tips, I think for a, a young artist. And if we look at you, Brendan, your niche is kind of this darker artwork and you're involved in, in music in more heavy metal, heavy rock type of bands. Right. So yeah. those are the type of people that seem to maybe be your circle of influence and that um, not that you're you're marketing to them. It just seems to all coalesce with with each other and maybe other artists out there. If, you know, there's there's different things in your life that you're interested in. And I'm sure that's influencing their lives as well. And, and like attracts like and people totally. like. Yeah. So I believe, you know, it's not about having this ulterior motive, but it's it's networking w- with those type of people and you know, that artwork that you're going to create and those type of people that you're, you're kind of hanging out with, whether it's online or offline are, are probably going to be your, your clients, right? Yeah. I, yeah, to, I mean, a hundred percent. Um, and usually it does start small. It starts, it starts at the, at the home base level. It starts with your friends. If, you know, if they need a, a logo done or a, or an album cover done, or if it's a small business, you know, like I said, they need a logo or a t-shirt design or something, you know, that's kind of how you can start or working with, if you do have, say, if you're, if you're, if you have a collection of pieces and you want to show them, you know, go, go to a local cafe and, and see if they'll hang them, you know, and start small and, and just keep at it and have a website, have a, have a place where people can, can go and, and find the work and interact with it. Um, it's funny when I, when I see artists, I think there, there is a lot of a lot of effort towards the social media aspect of things and towards the digital realm. But when it comes to like the physical side of things, when I've seen so many artists, not even that young, when they hang at a local restaurant or something, there's no contact info anywhere. There's no no name. It's just pieces on a wall. And then if, at my restaurant, we we hang local artists, um, their work, not the actual artists, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. So we we show them and they won't they won't have contact info and then maybe someone will come up to me at the bar and say hey who's who's the artist up there and, I'm, and i look and i'm like i i don't know <laughs> i don't I, wasn't told. <laughs> I don't know where to send them which is this that's just like to me so i don't know it's so silly that that but that's something that i think might might not be intuitive for a lot of creative people because they're so focused on like making the work and then hustling and hanging it and then it's just like they don't have the business side of things to kind of figure that out, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think you develop, you developed that? Did you develop that possibly from the music side? Cause you know how you have to hustle that. Well, um, and maybe I, that parlayed into art. I, I will, I, I will say that, um, where I went to school, they focused a lot on the business side of things. I mean, well, okay. not a lot, I guess that just enough. Cause we, um, and it was it was funny because I felt like the the program that I was in the way that it was set up was an, it was a fossil from the 60s and 70s like the what they expected of the artists like doing to graduate I needed to make you know 10 cold calls to um, art directors <laughs> or, or or whatever or then have like a physical portfolio you know and, and you had to get a, a portfolio made and you had to get prints made and you had to learn how to color correct and do all these things like scan, scan or or, or uh, take photos of your work and then learn how to color correct, which is very important. I still think people should know how to do that. But, um, but all these things that were, we weren't required to build a website. We weren't required to, um, you know, uh, know how to work social media. Cause it wasn't, it was in its infancy. It was, you know, MySpace was still around. Um, Facebook was just like, you know, for Yale or, you know, whatever, I forgot where it started, but it, it wasn't what it is now by any means. YouTube was, Definitely not. I don't even know if YouTube was even a thing yet when I graduated. But um, but then the, and within the next year or two, you know, everyone was required to have a laptop. Everyone everyone was required to build a website and all these things that I kind of missed out on that I had to fumble in the dark to do. Um, but at the same time, I did learn how I did learn the importance of like 
to all that little detail of just <laughs> having business cards and, you know, talking to people and all that sort of stuff that I still think is important on some level. I feel like because the internet is such an easy tool to use for everybody, it ends up not being important anymore. So it's like having a website, it's important to have, but like, I feel like if you wanted to, to make an impression on an art director or um, a, a gallerist or whatever, meeting them in person, shaking their hand and showing that you're actually a person that makes this thing and making that one-on-one -on -one connection goes so much farther um, than, than having uh, an Instagram page, you know? Uh, so I, I, I definitely learned more of the professional side from, I think, from college. And then being in a band, that was a whole other nightmare in itself. And I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it, it is the most like soul destroying thing that you can do. Uh, I think <laughs> in, in, in my experience, I, I love, I love making music, but trying to be in a band with four or five other people, or whatever it might be, whatever, you know, and having everyone's opinion and everyone's ego and everyone, you know, it's like being in, in a marriage with four different people. It's crazy. And then yeah. and also being like just manhandled by every aspect of the business, you know what I mean? Like, and being and not being paid adequately. And so it ends up being like, if you want to tour as a young band, you, it's a vac it's a, a, a vacation that you have to pay for. And then, you know, and then like nothing sadder than playing in front of like the other bands and their girlfriends. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's the worst. <laughs> Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, after, um, after driving hours too, right? <laughs> yeah. But then also too, I think certain, certain countries have a much better infrastructure for um, artists in general, but also for, for, for live music, you know, touring Europe was a dream compared to touring the U S I mean, the U S does not, the, the booking agents, the, um, I think the, the way that people consume the music, it's, I don't know, it's, it was, it didn't allow for, um, a, a healthy, uh, back and forth or a healthy, I don't know. It seemed, it seemed very parasitic, I guess. It wasn't symbiotic by any means. <laughs> yeah. America has a, a tendency <laughs> to do that. But I you mean, that, that... even, even laws for venues, like, you know, when, in Europe, like if, if a, ve a venue was, was required to give you a per diem or a, 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 a booking agent was required to give you a per diem for food. And if not so have food, like have either, either like a deli platter or like make you food or whatever it might be. And then if a venue didn't have a shower, they were required to rent out a, like a, a hostel room or whatever for you to shower. Um, that was just, I don't know if that was law, but that was just, it seemed like that was what was required of them. At Otherwise, the least. yeah, yeah, it was, just, I think there was an appreciation there that isn't really felt over here. And I, I, and I think that's for lower tier bands. I think maybe if you, if you are popular, whatever, like they'll, they'll bend over backwards for, you know, name whatever pop artist or whatever, you know, A or B tier band is out there, but for level C and D tier bands, it's like, it's way different. Yeah, that's interesting. And I wonder what's going to happen, you know, uh, with this coronavirus. I know there's a lot of uh, bands that are hurting and uh, that won't be able to kind of survive. And as you had said, it's hard to make it when it's good, you know, um, and then when it's bad, I'm sure it's even even rougher. Um, so maybe this will be good for some bands that stick around. There'll be, you know, less clutter, less noise, yeah. you know, where they're, they're good art, you know, because there's a lot of ton of good bands that don't get found and uh, remain unknown, don't make money, um, you know, and then there's there's bands that seem to kind of rise to the top that are that are terrible, you know, and just a ton of bands in general, you know. So well, I, I definitely hope that there's a at least a wave of just people being cooped up and wanting to go out and and participate in that. And I think that'll be awesome, at least for a little, a little while. I don't know how long it'll last. Um, cause people can definitely get complacent and fall back into routine, but I, I hope that that's going to happen. I've noticed, and this, I know this is anecdotal and I'm sure this isn't the case for, um, a lot of bands, but I know that, uh, I was talking to a friend who owns a screen printing company and he lost a lot of his clients overnight cause he works with a lot of touring bands. Um, but some of those bands actually I don't know if you've noticed, but some bands are doing like the live streams, you know, they're playing yeah. a live set from a stage or from their homes and they're actually making more money 
<laughs> off of donations and off of streams on YouTube than they are than they would ever make during one show, <laughs> which is wow. <laughs> Which is which is nice to hear, but also like kind of sad <laughs> in a way <laughs> that people are, are are happy to do it from their couch, you know, or, yeah. or maybe it's like a little too late. It's like, oh, man, damn, I, you know, I could have spent that money to go out and see him live. But sure. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And then I'm sure that will become saturated because everybody seems to kind of be gravitating, gravitating towards that as well. Yeah, um, I think another thing, too, and this isn't this isn't just because of the times we're in now with the coronavirus but um the one thing i realized at the end of and i know i sound so so jaded and i apologize about that but uh at the end when i was with the uh my old band um i started to realize that it's actually better to focus just on your fans than trying to reach everybody trying to figure out like who likes you and um sort of who have who has similar tastes and, and and trying to focus all of your effort on just a small demographic than trying to reach the world that'll do you way more favors and that that goes that goes for visual art that goes for any art form i think um even a restaurant you know what i mean like just knowing your demographic and and focusing just on them um and i felt like that would act, is actually how you can make a better living than wasting your money on pr and and to get to like every single platform every you know what i mean yeah, that's yeah, that's great advice. As you had said, that could be in anything. I, I think there was a, a book, The Law of a Thousand. If you you get a, a thousand followers or fans or so forth, you know, um, you could be basically, you know, the idea is not, of course, to get taken care of life, but you know, hopefully you could support yourself with your work. And if you have a thousand fans um with their support and you nurturing that support you know, that will grow your fan base as well because those thousand right. fans that, you know, and you'll just, you know, and that's kind of the, the underground effect, you know, that um, it's the, the best thing to do, you know. Another another thing that, that kind of goes along with this, but also to your previous question about if I had any recommendations or advice for a, a young artist or musician or whatever, I think another thing to do is playing the long game isn't always the, is I think, the better idea um, as far as like making work and style and trying to sell it or just trying to even rise above um, the murmur. Um, because I feel like if you're, if there's, there's tons of pressure to try to try to know what's, know what's hot, know what's what people are buying or what's popular and it's just copy it just so you can kind of ride that wave, but that wave will end so soon. So I feel like a lot of the artists that I love and, and, and are inspired by are the ones that just stuck to, to their guns and they, they, through thick and thin, just stuck with what they're um, good at and what they like to do and what spoke to them. And that ended up benefiting them in the long run. You know, you might not see it in, in, for 10 years, but like at least you're creating work that you, you can uh, sort of, uh, you're happy to make. Like I would, and I, I thought about maybe making an alias and, and doing pet portraits or some, some stupid. <laughs> you know, thing, um, that would speak to a, a lot more people, but then, then, but then that becomes something that you hate to do. And I would, I would be so sad if I started to not want to paint anymore because I was trying to make it just about money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and also I think another thing that's important to, to realize too, is there's no shame in having another job to, to back it up. If that's if, if you're not fortunate enough to to have a big following right away or because some people do fall ass backwards into luck like that. You know, some people can make a career right off the bat because maybe they just have a style that speaks to a lot of people. But if, if you don't, you know, having a job that can sort of like support you while you while you find that is there's no shame in it. And I feel like that's another thing I wish I was told, you know, if like you're still a professional art, artist, if you're. You have a job, yeah. <laughs> you know. Right. You're, you're still a professional artist. That's fine. Or an artist yeah. in general. Yeah. And when does that happen? Again, you know, I, I would say you're definitely a professional artist. I'm not um, an artist myself, but it, it would seem when you're, you know, commissioning pieces and you're selling artwork and, uh, you know, people are hiring you, you're now a, a professional, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're, I, th I feel like that is sort of the in my mind, the jump is that if you're just making artwork and you're doing it for yourself or for your friends, whatever, but if you're, if you're selling it and you're, you're making a product for 
someone else make money off of, or if you're just doing jobs, like that, I feel like that's, that's kind of what makes you a professional. If you're consistently making work for money, I think that's, I think you can consider, consider yourself a professional artist. Um, I could be wrong about that, but that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. And I, I actually, I, I have a, a book that I'm writing, uh, right now and, um, you're going to do the, the cover definitely. And, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to, yeah, I, but some people, I, I'm not going to ask you now, but what, like if someone wanted to hire Brendan, does it depend on, on the piece or, or what do they, they need to like email you and kind of discuss? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every project's different. I think, you know, for, for the album artwork, I have a consistent price that I do per image. Um, and I'm glad to do, you know, package deals if they want more than one image or if they want layout work, whatever. Um, you know, uh, cause you know, I have a lot of empathy for, for people, especially if you're in a, in a smaller band, you know, but I feel like with, with, with bigger bands that, that actually have budgets, which is rare. Um, so, you know, I'll ask, usually I'll start and ask what their budget is. But I do I do have a flat a sort of a flat fee for for the artwork for for uh, record covers. But at the same time as other other factors that are not really talked about is use. And if uh, you know, and use and and what it's worth to the company, like the the Nike Swish logo, I don't think that took that designer much time to do that. But that's a billion dollar. That's worth, you know, that's worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. You no. Know? So it's like it's 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 about how much it's your it's your intellectual property and it's how it's going to be used, you know, and the visibility of it. And I feel like that can be that is factored into um, the pricing of artwork. Um, but that's I'm not at that level, you know. I, I don't have a, the client the client my my client base is uh, some some label bands, but some DIY, a lot of DIY bands and um, local, local business, you know, so they're just starting out. They don't have the budget to do that kind of stuff. So you kind of have to keep that in mind as well, because you'll never get work if you're, if you're kind of going, going by the big boys that, you know, are making that kind of money. Um, so I feel like it is, it is kind of like a, you don't want to cheat yourself. You don't want to downplay and, and do stuff for free, but also too, like you have to kind of weigh it out. Um, but yeah, so if, if to answer your question, sorry, I'm on a tangent there, but, uh, if, if you wanted to hire me, you definitely like email me or, or like message me on Facebook or Instagram and, and, um, you know, get the process started. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm always willing to work with a budget, you know, within reason, like I'm not going to work 50 hours for nothing, but <laughs> sure. <laughs> it makes sense. And, and what I gather from what you said, Brendan, is you, you know, you have your artwork out there and of course, anybody that's interested in it, like us, if you know, I'm I'm looking to do a book or a band is looking to do a cover, we're checking out, you know, various bands that you've worked with or people and the various things. And, you know, I'm sure those are the things that um you have kind of that flat price when we, we call, we were like, Hey, you know, you're like, Oh, it depends how long I'm gonna work, you know, we'd be like, Man, that could be forever. So you have to, you know, with us with a budget, you have to have some type of thing and then if it's Metallica or some band that wants something done and, you know, this artwork's going to be seen, it's not that you're going to charge them more because they have more money. It's just a, it's a different level of where your artwork's going to go and, and so forth. Right. Totally. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, well, yeah, it is, it is visibility. Um, and what they're going to, they're going to make a lot of money off of it. Yeah, <laughs> right. It, well, it's right. Right. So, you know, if, so if you look at like, I'll, I'll give you two different scenarios. So, you know, if you go to a show or if you're driving down the highway and say you have like um, I, I have this term for like <laughs> artwork that doesn't look professional. It looks local. That's what I always say. It, like you can tell a local franchise from a, a national franchise. Like you can tell like the local car dealership bill, bill, billboard from like a Budweiser billboard. You know, just the design is just better. It looks cleaner. It just looks more put, put together. The photography isn't granulated and, and they didn't take like a, a tiny photo that wasn't made for a billboard and blow it up. So it looks all pixelated. You know, they know what they're doing. They have they hired someone to do it properly. So the same thing with a, with a, a local band at a show. Like if you go down the, the merch tables and you have a local band opening nine times out of ten, you can see that. Oh, wow. they That's a local band because the T-shirt's like one color. The design maybe 
not that great or it's just a font put on the t-shirt it wasn't designed for them but you know so i always tell you know uh bands that, that younger bands that come to hire me and if my budget which i think is still extremely fair if they if they him and haw and say oh we don't have the money for it it's like well you're going to be you want to open for national acts coming through your town no one's going to want to buy your merch outside of your your parents you know if it doesn't compete with the national acts so you like in investing in the art is i think sometimes more important than actually the actual music on this on the <laughs> cd because <laughs> that's the first thing that people interact with is the is the album cover especially or the or the t-shirt design you know so that's one area but i know that that local band and their use of it they're not gonna they're only gonna use it for that one t-shirt they don't have the money to make mugs and baseball caps and banners and stuff they're gonna they're probably gonna use it for one t-shirt and move on to the next or whatever um sure. but if you have a band like metallica and i mean a, a, take tool a great example right now because on their on their recent tour supporting their new album i mean they have an artist in every city which i think is fantastic they're, they're such great supporters of of local artists but they're hiring artists in every city to make a poster but they're selling i don't even want to know how much money in merch you know per city and if you take a band like Metallica and they they have one design that they're selling in every city, they're gonna have to reprint that shirt probably every week to to keep up with demand. And they're making a buttload of money off of that one design. So it would suck if you're a local artist that's like, ah, you know, this is so cool I'm working for Metallica, which I mean that's that's a, a personal decision to weigh out. Um, whether like that's enough of a payment, you know, having that be like the visibility aspect of it, you know. Um, but at the same time, they're making a lot of money off of you and off of your off of your uh, your intellectual property. Um, and I don't want to sound too corporatist or whatever, or or but it, it it does. If you want to try to make a living off of the arts, which I am not, so like <laughs> you, you have to you have to be able to sort of make those calls and and not be afraid to ask for more money when, when it calls for it, you know? I mean, if you could, Brendan, you know, your artwork, in my opinion, is at that level where, you know, you should be uh, making a living. I'm sure you know a ton of people that are very creative and, you know, they have, you know, second and third jobs to support themselves. But, you know, if you could, I'm sure you would, you know, and you have to have that that business acumen you know if you don't people will take advantage of you um that's just it doesn't matter whether it's in the the music world or whether it's in the art world it's it's all business you know yeah well and also i think i think um a lot of artists that i know are very empathetic people i don't know a lot of artists that are that are that business minded where they're just cutthroat you know yeah. um, and so they're more than willing to like be you know give the deal be the best friend you know what i mean like and it and and keep giving the deal they like if, if, if they have a returning client and a client comes back four years later they're going to give them the deal that they had four years ago which is bullshit but <laughs> um, but that's i mean that's about how how it works a lot of times is i think a lot of times that can be i think it's a great quality to have but sometimes it can be um defeating defeatist you know what i mean um and that's yeah. not and, and, and that's not how how business works, unfortunately. <laughs> no. Well, I, I think it's having that and, and knowing when to be cool with, with that aspect and flexible and then when not to be when it's on the higher level and when you're dealing with people that are making a lot of money or going to make a lot of money off your artwork. You know, you um, should get paid, you know, and everybody should get paid that contribute uh, to any type of um, business endeavor or whatever. And you know, if we could all just, you know, do our art or whatever we love to do and get paid, um, we wouldn't have to talk about business and, and charge. You know, you could probably do art and just do, you know, people would line up, you know, and you could decide who you want to draw right. for if, if you could, you know, support yourself. Right. And live yeah. the life you want to live. It doesn't seem like you're uh, you're kind of a modest guy. You don't need much. Right. No, no. I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's funny. Like, I I feel like I'm a pretty gregarious person. But when it comes to my art, I, I tighten up and get super shy <laughs> when, it comes, when, when people give me compliments. It's like, uh, you know, I don't I don't know what to say, you know. Um, and also when it comes to people that I admire, I have no idea uh, <laughs> how to respond to that, you know, like, or how, how to how to interact. You know, I, I just I, I clam up 
it's really funny. <laughs> um, so what, what, what's next for, for Brendan? What do you have planned? Um, I know again, you're, you're out of work for a little bit as far as your, your day job. Do you have any artwork, artwork that you're working on now or? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm currently working on, um, uh, front and back cover for a, a band. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. Like they, they were very easy to work for so, so far. I mean, they seem like really cool people and I feel like they hired, they, they went about it the right way where they, they found the artists that fit their sound or what they're looking for, you know? So they, they saw my portfolio and, and hired me based off of that, which is very refreshing. And, um, we immediately kind of agreed upon a, uh, a visual language, I guess, you know, which is really, really nice. Um, uh, then after that, I've got um, I've got a comic book cover I got to do for a, a a company that doesn't really do comics very often, but they're they're kind of making different product lines just to support um, what what they do. So that'll be that'll be a fun project. And then I have some gallery work that some of the galleries that I work with are going online now, so they're doing strictly online shows. So I got some of that coming on. So yeah, yeah, that'll and that'll be interesting. I work working on a that second album for my, my band diagonal path. So staying busy. Yeah. Maybe you'll, uh, stay busy where you, you don't need that other, that bartending job. Do you in, enjoy uh, doing the bartending or does sometimes that, that get old? Uh, it definitely feels like groundhog day <laughs> for, the, uh, for sure. Um, but sometimes I wonder if, uh, if that structure is helpful you know, like I, I'm finding that I actually don't have a problem with sticking to a schedule right now, but um, I, I wonder in the long term if having like that extra job that just to, to kind of create more structure would be beneficial for me. I don't know if I could have that kind of focus to to set my own schedule strictly. So ha- having just other things to do, to keep myself active, I feel like I, I, I can stay more on point. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Totally. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I do, I do enjoy, uh, enjoy that. But at the same time as I, I can get, uh, um, if I, if I have a bad, bad interaction or a bad day at work, whatever with, with, uh, coworkers or with, with, uh, customers, I can get kind of depressed about it. And, and it's like, man, people are willing to poison themselves and tip me, but not pay for original artwork, you know? <laughs> and, and so, but I have to, I have to also jostle myself out of that because I'm also in a very fortunate position where I work three days a week and, and I granted I live, uh, pretty, pretty cheaply. Like Syracuse is not an expensive place to live. Um, and I don't, and I don't have a very expensive lifestyle. So I can pay all my bills in three days of work and then I have four days a week to do what I want to do, which I feel like is so lucky. Um, so I, that's, that's kind of how I always kind of try to get myself out of any rut that I find myself in is just to remind myself that that's a really good place to be. So, yeah, that's a, and that's a great kind of lifestyle. Uh, meaning if you're, you're an artist to, to have that second job where it's only a few days a week and you, like you had said, you have four days a week to do, do what you want, but those three days, kind of keep you on point, keep you kind of in the, in the world per se, where you're not, you know, in your, your cave, just drawing all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, do you ever have a problem with that where, um, you might get on, you know, be a little unhealthy, unbalanced, imbalanced. Uh, with no, your no, I, I, I try to work out, uh, four or five days a week and I try to, I, I love, I, I love my friends. So I try to make time for that. I try to go out and get lunch or, you know, have a few, have a beer with, with some friends, whatever. That, that's super important to me. And I, and I also, uh, know the importance of, of taking a break and giving your, your brain a rest. Um, cause sometimes like, like I talked about earlier is <clears throat> artists have spinning their wheels, not knowing how to finish something. And I think sometimes just stepping back, give it, giving it a break, giving the piece or the, whatever you're doing a break and then coming back to it with fresh eyes, fresh ears, you'll just be like, Oh man, why did I do that? Like I need, you know, I got to change this or that. I got to change the lighting or this doesn't look right. This, you know, the proportions on that are, are wrong. You know, you, you can kind of answer your own questions that you were just, you were kind of so, uh, you know, horse blinders on, you're just kind of so honed in on one thing that you didn't see the bigger picture. 
And I think that learning that was really important. So I don't know, I guess I don't really have, I don't have a hard time um, with, I, I have a good balance right now, I guess. Yeah, that's good. You know, and I, I think that's important with, with anybody, whatever they do in life is that you have that balance where, you know, you have a little of everything you, you love to keep you in check. And uh, we definitely need that interaction with, with friends and, and loved ones. And Brendan, you know, thank you for your time. Where can people find your, your great work? Um, so my Instagram is uh, at b.flynn.art. So that's B-F-L-Y-N-N dot art. And then um, my website is uh, brendanflynn.com. Um, you can search my name on Facebook. I don't post there as often. I, I probably should get back into that, but I kind of uh, have gone gotten away from Facebook just because it, it gives people a lot more of a chance to spew their ignorance than Instagram. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel that, um, I, I've been taken in by Facebook myself. I, I don't spend a lot of time there anymore. Like I used to, and you get taken into people's feeds and, you know, they, they influence your, your thoughts. And I would get negative, um, not negative myself, but I would see a lot of negative um, thoughts and people and comments and it just uh, it wasn't what I wanted to see and interact with and every time I'd open my Facebook even if it was to interact with the people that I'd like I would see just a lot of that yeah and, uh, and it's and it's easy to kind of get sucked into that um, that negativity you know and, and it's it's fascinating to me that you could have the best day everyone everyone just smiling at you and, and showing you love and then you get that one person that just has that one negative comment and it just brings you down for whatever reason it could be it could be a one to 100 ratio <laughs> like the negativity always seems to i don't know for me anyway it always seems to kind of like create a just a dark cloud over everything and so i i just for my own mental health i just i think i've learned i'm, I'm starting to learn not that i've i have this down but i'm trying to figure out like um what is negative and what's positive and and try to just cut all that negative stuff out of my life you know and and just sort of like realize like yeah i need to read the i need to stay up to date with current events and the news but like know when it's starting to make my heart rate go up to stop you know what i mean like <laughs> for my own health my own <laughs> so yeah no that that's great advice that's a that's a great way to end this this podcast i agree with you 100 percent, brendan uh, it was nice talking to you getting to yeah, know you you know, and uh, thank you for your, your patience, you know, uh, t t so the listeners know it took a couple of days to connect with Brendan, um, had a couple issues with my my business, but uh, he was very patient and cool. And it's always nice to, you know, meet someone like Brendan and uh, for someone to be so cool and patient. Thank you very much, man. Um, thank you, Mo. You're welcome. And uh, I'll post this podcast on my website. Listeners go to GnosticWarrior.com slash Brendan, B R E N. D O N, and I'll have links to his website as well. Um, take care, man. Nice talking to you. Too. Thank you so much. You're welcome.